So my name is Beth Sandlin. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I help empower people really tap into our, their authentic voice in both moving and teaching through the Pilates method uh, with the tenets of support, education, and exploration. Amazing. And you have two handles. I do. Um, we're I'm coming to you from at Trauma Informed Pilates. I would say my main handle um, is Trifecta Pilates, but it was sometime after I created that that I knew I needed to create a trauma informed approach uh, for Pilates instructors. And I thought about should they be merged? Should they uh, be separate? And because when you speak about trauma, right, it c can be very triggering that I wanted to keep trifecta Pilates more of a quote unquote safe space, um, more person facing. And it's not that trauma informed Pilates isn't person facing, it's more uh, target audience would be Pilates teachers. And there's some crossover there um, with people who follow me each way. But for now, that makes the most sense uh, for a variety of reasons. I could see this like you're you're still debating that a little bit in your head because there's there's need with both and there's overlap with both, but the layman might not see the value in one over the other. Mm -hmm. And there's also um, this is also why I say like I don't say I teach a, in a trauma informed approach necessarily. Like when I teach mm -hmm. a Pilates class, I teach Pilates, and that's because some individuals either don't understand that they've had trauma, don't want to identify with their trauma, don't want to be reminded of their trauma. And so I want to create that safe space, even if it's not trauma informed, um, yes. like labeled as such. And then there's other people who really are seeking a trauma informed Pilates approach and they want mm -hmm. to tap into one of those classes. And so I'll teach those specific classes sometimes as well. So that's kind of the, the limbo I'm experiencing yes. and I've just embraced not knowing the answer right away because um, I am where I'm supposed to be right now. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you the, talk a little bit more about the trauma piece? Like I was saying in my earlier messages, having a counseling background, that wasn't my point of emphasis. Uh, so people start to fear labels as well around trauma. Right, so it it becomes very convoluted and, and very obscure. So, can you explain what you mean by the term like a trauma informed approach? It's just the simplest way I can put it is the realization that any person that we engage with could have very well likely experienced trauma at some point in their life and not even realize that it was trauma because this is not language that we traditionally have used over the years. It's been misidentified, misdiagnosed, um, shamed, belittled, I mean, the list goes on. And so yes. really it's just the understanding that when we go to touch someone or the words that we use or how someone moves in Pilates or um, how they're interacting with us is not only influenced by our education and background in the Pilates method, that they are more than a body, right? Um, yes. And so understanding once I had this aha, like, oh, well, we are trying to talk about people embody the Pilates work. And if someone has experienced trauma, if they've disassociated, that will be a barrier to embodying the work. And so yes. I, I think we really need to understand um, that because what can happen is I always say if people embody Pilates, they must embody the rest of their lives. And there's a very yeah. good reason why some people dissociate. Um, it was their survival mechanism is still right. working for them in some sense. And mm -hmm. so there's, it's a client centered approach, I say, and a teacher centered approach, because sometimes yeah. I turn to like Facebook groups and there's a lot of, um, I, for lack of a better word, frustration with Pilates instructors on themselves. Like, why isn't this client progressing? They're just not getting it. Their shoulders are still rounding forward. It's like, hey, let the work unfold for that client. You can try different tools, but it could be something so much bigger than More the cues you're using. And they're going to progress at their own pace and you're gonna work alongside them. So another big uh, aspect is leveling the power differential. And whenever someone comes to us as a person, right? We term them a lot of times clients. 
we are a Pilates instructor and we have a sense of power because we know the Pilates method usually more than they do unless they're a Pilates instructor. And so we want to try to work alongside them uh, to really help foster their personal journey. And another aspect of a trauma-informed approach is that we understand that with trauma, there's a loss of power and control. And this is where I know it ties in beautifully with the Pilates method, which it's all about power and control. It's just yeah. that sometimes the way it's taught can feel disempowering and like the person doesn't have the control over their experience. So that's yeah. what I'm trying to thread in that um, an individual has the control and power over their experience in their body. And this is a journey that takes a long time. Yes, absolutely. But could, could you not say that everyone has some sort of trauma? Yes, <laughs> I mean, I, I prescribe by that because, so when I first got into this, um, I was teaching at a university. I was teaching Matt Pilates. I was also an administrator. And one of the instructors who worked for me, she's director of a local nonprofit here in Denver for interpersonal violence, was talking to me about a trauma-informed yoga approach. And at the okay. same time, I was having conversations with the LGBTQ Student Resource Center and the um, like interpersonal violence office on campus about what it means to enfold consent into an interaction. And this isn't consent between two partners. This is like administrator student. This is yes. professor student. With a power imbalance. Peer to peer. Yeah. What does that mean? And so yes. these two aligned and thought, oh, well, what's what's a trauma informed yoga approach? And then I was really intrigued and was like, this could be really valuable. Okay, let me get education Ooh. in trauma informed Pilates. And there was none. And I thought, mm. oh, this is weird. And they kept looking and like looking. And so it was self-study. It was tapping into best practices. Um, at the same time, a couple of years later, I should say, we uh, started unfolding a trauma-informed approach into the health clinic that I worked in because we were doing a transgender healthcare protocol and okay. realized in the forums that we did, someone made a very poignant comment that I went to your clinic and someone went to touch my partner and they weren't ready for that. Don't they know mm. that people experience trauma and that impacts them? And I thought, no. <laughs> and our director of behavioral health <laughs> said, you know, medical providers, we aren't trained in this, but we need right. to be, right? Yes. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, that person goes into the clinic on campus, they could very well come into my Pilates studio and even though I, in my training, it was like how to touch someone the right way so it's not misconstrued, how to make it comfortable, there was never really a conversation about should you touch, shouldn't you? How are you getting consent? Is it explicit or implicit? Like more of the nuances. Um, and, and so first I was very focused on uh, trauma-informed approach to be an advocate for sexual assault survivors. And then I realized the deeper I went into this like, oh my goodness, it's, it's everything. And like, oh, I have experienced trauma. And that mm. was like, oh, that's yes. why with some people I worked really well and other people, it was a barrier to work effectively because it was bringing up my own trauma story. Yes. Um, yes. So yeah, I really feel like it's, again, not only helpful for clients who see us, but for our own personal journey as well. Absolutely. And what I love about this is that it's, uh, you're, you're speaking so beautifully about this. It normalizes the conversation. And I think that that needs to be done a lot because you may think trauma and think weakness. And I want to be strong. And I'll be silent and I'll muscle through it and I'll move on. And maybe this will help me. And then we're going to bring it back up to the surface again in this setting and you may not even realize it. So the fact that we have these conversations normalizes it. And I, I like the way that you're putting it out there because we can see that, you know, people do have trauma and trauma looks different for many different people. Agreed. Um, and it's, it's, I think one of the concerns that a lot of Pilates instructors have with the trauma informed approach is that, that we're counseling and it's like 100% no <laughs> this can and is applied in so many different settings start in the social work field and then branched out from there that's why like k-12 through educators now are embedding a trauma-informed approach because a lot of the kids that they work with experience trauma within their household and i think yes. okay well kids are experiencing trauma within their household and they 
may one day walk into the Pilates studio. Like, what do we do with that lineage, right? Yes. Um, so that's yeah. really why I felt the need to create a program for this. And it's interesting, the moment that I started putting it out there, I had both Pilates instructors and clients reach out to me, say, thank you so much for this approach. I've had really negative interactions with people and I never told my Pilates instructor. And that's the key because so oftentimes it's easy to look at these like really um, inflammatory stories, like gross abuse stories of, for instance, we've seen this in the um, yoga community where it was like sexual assault basically happening from yes. a yoga teacher to a client. It's easy to say, I don't do that, right? But it's more challenging to say, okay, how can I be more inclusive? How can I be more sensitive to the people walking in the door? How can I continue to improve my best practices yes. um, as a Pilates instructor? And I always see if we are to accept and I accept that Pilates is a mind body movement modality that there had not been the training really that I had been to that spoke to the mind and the impact, how the brain can impact um, someone's experience, interpersonal right. experience and movement experience as well. I'm writing stuff down because I'm like, you're saying so many brilliant things. I'm like, okay, let me go back to that. But I don't want to interrupt you. You're doing great. Um, the the notion of bringing awareness to it, I think with this course that like you're saying, could it be that people are just afraid to go here because they don't feel competent to counsel it? Like they feel like if I get this information, now I'm responsible to, to solve this person's problems or to fix them mm -hmm. as well as teach them to be good at Pilates. I think it's more empowering once you understand it, um, that you know your boundaries more, what they are as a Pilates instructor and could pick up on signs when it would be nice to offer a referral. Just like we might yes. offer a referral, moving with someone that's like, mm, yeah, that's, let, let's, why don't you go see a medical specialist perhaps, or um, maybe working with a physical therapist would be really beneficial for you and yes. giving someone the tools to do that because yes. I think a lot of boundaries are being crossed that people aren't even aware that they're sure. being crossed. That was the word I've written down. It's awareness, and I think that you know, as as we continue to to learn and hone our craft in terms of getting technically better at our plotties, sharpening those skills and giving us that eye to recognize mental health issues and trauma situations that people may be going through, helps just to make us better as as teachers, coaches. Um, because like you said, that analogy is perfect. You know, if I see someone moving and their shoulder is stuck, I can make some adjustments, take them to somewhere else in the in the work and get them moving better. But then I might recognize that, no, you definitely need to see an athletic therapist or an osteo or a chiro. We've been trained to recognize those physical barriers and when to refer. And I think that we need to refine those skills with the mental health issues that people bring to it, the studio as well. Agreed. And, and I think another beautiful aspect of a trauma-informed approach is you, as, as an individual Pilates instructor, I can know this when I am responding versus reacting, right? Yeah. And you, yeah. I can pick up on when uh, someone else, an like instructor or a client, I just like to call them people, when someone else is responding or reacting and what happens is sometimes a client will react right and then yes. that triggers us and we react and it sometimes can escalate the situation rather than holding space for the client being aware of maybe when we are going down the path of reaction so that we can course correct in the time that makes sense for us and respond yes you said a phrase in there, it's, it's kind of a, a trendy catchphrase that I like a lot, not because it's trendy, it's bad, but, but we say it a lot, holding space. Mm -hmm. Can you define that for me? It's honoring someone's journey <gasps> and, sorry, <gasps> my dog. <laughs> it's honoring- I've had kids running by in the background. It's all good. It's, it's off to do. school time. It's the two days mm -hmm. that they go to school and it's off to school time, so. <laughs> Uh, it's honoring someone where they are right now and not being um, invested into it. There's a sense of detachment and also awareness that, and I'll give you a clear example. There was a point when I couldn't hold space for people who wanted to, who, who where they were in their journey 
they couldn't progress at a rate that I thought they should progress. And okay. so I'm a cancer survivor. When I was, that's how I got into Pilates. And I was subbing for someone else whose client was also a cancer survivor. And this client was doing beautiful work. I mean, such beautiful work, um, lifting and opening her chest, but she kept sinking in. Not uncommon, right? We see people, people make a correction and then they go back. And I kept encouraging her to go open. What I didn't realize is I was moving at my own pace and not her pace. And she broke yes. down and said, I feel like I'm doing everything wrong. Like you're yelling at me. And I felt really, really bad at that time still. Mm -hmm. But now after the uh, trauma informed lens, I was like, Oh, I wasn't working at her pace and holding space for her. Like she could do it. I should have just let it go. Right. Yes. Um, and then maybe another time explored that a little bit deeper. So that, that's what it means. It takes a great amount, I think, of self-awareness um, of ourselves and what and the client as well. Yes, I hear that. I'm just kind of musing on that for a second. That's, that's really good. Because we, we, we want to go at our pace sometimes. And it's, I think it's well intended too, uh, where I'm so excited about a client or what they can do, or we have this vision of their potential. Like I said earlier this week, my son had a little bit of a breakdown around his basketball. And he's like, you always feel like I'm the best player in the world. You, you, you make me feel like, like, and he has these words like, you're saying all this stuff, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, I'm looking at it from my perspective and I see your full potential. And I'm trying to push you to that potential and not respect your path and not respect your pace to get there. And holding space is the opposite of that. <laughs> right. And that's exactly right. what happened with that client. I was, I saw her potential. She was doing beautiful work. I felt like I was being encouraging, but that's not what she needed at the time. So part of a trauma informed approach is understanding how we innately naturally teach. And I naturally push harder um, and very encouraging, but some people need me to hold back so that yes. their path can be followed right and other people right. really dig that and like that's what they need um, to continue and progress with the method yes we have lots to learn <laughs> lots to learn i was reading some of your blogs um and you know occasionally i i will i go into our core conversations just cold i'd like love to hear the story from you the first time um, I just got enthralled with your, your blogs, though. They're so good and so real and so touching. Um, I'd love to hear more about your story around your cancer and how you've used that story to empower others. Yeah, thanks for um, reading the blogs. I just started. I'm kind of late to the game, but um, I'm really trying to tie in that personal approach to going back in my history and kind of weeding out interactions that high, stood out to me and yes. um, how maybe that has shaped why a trauma-informed approach is so important. So I was diagnosed with cancer at age 20 in college. I dropped out of college um, for the semester because I needed inpatient treatment. And basically, like some of the highlights of the story are um, <laughs> you – you're strong, you can do this, um, push through. And sometimes it's like, I didn't want to. Like, mm -hmm. it's interesting because as a cancer survivor, sometimes you're never given the choice to like be in um, the victim mode. And it's not that I want to identify with that, but I was never able to, able to process that, right? Like what was taken away from me at that particular yes. time. There were a lot of interactions, um, that like just simple phrases that people say that stuck out to me or with like nurses or doctors that were either very positive, like telling me exactly what's going to happen and like being compassionate with my family and others that was like, that was really a bad, bad experience. And I didn't yeah. realize until later um, what to call it. And I didn't understand it was like 
seven years later, maybe I went back in, I was part of a uh, research study, like wh why some people do well after cancer treatment and some people continue to have cancer related fatigue. And so I went into the hospital and into the bathroom and I was washing my hands. And the moment that I started pressing the soap, I just started crying and I didn't understand what that was. And that was a triggered response, right? Because that soap smell reminded me and instantly took me back to being in the hospital in the present moment where I was. And I didn't really ever tell anyone about this um, because we didn't talk about like, oh, this is actually quite normal for you to process and go through. I mean, still sometimes like certain smells or um, certain interactions can remind me of that and just instantly bring that moment back. It's uncomfortable for those around us to see us struggle, suffer. And, you know, it's almost like we're trying to accommodate their discomfort with our pain, right? Like, it's, mm -hmm. it sounds weird, but a lot of that happens. Um, so to give space for that is, is key. And you said, um, not to get hung up on words, but you said cancer survivor as opposed to a person who has survived cancer. Mm. It's funny how we choose some labels, for good or for bad, we choose labels right. to identify ourselves with, right? And that's why um, when I have time to like write it out, I'll usually say thriver. Um, yes. And it was also at a very young age for me, right? I was still yes. developing formative years, I would say. Um, I think it's shaped... It's, I mean, it's why I came to Pilates, <laughs> so it's huge yeah. for me. It's why I changed mm -hmm. my path from floral design to health education and then Pilates as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it greatly impacted my life. But words are powerful, and this is something I think, just having a conversation with someone else, that it's also knowing that whether you're a Pilates instructor or you start layering on a trauma-informed approach, that having grace, that we will never get it perfect. And I remember being yes. um, like working a, at the university teaching a Pilates mat class. And it was at a point in my trauma informed journey where I was like, I'm trauma informed, like this is so good. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, getting consent and not using touch as much. People like, they are so much more empowered. And then I realized I was using this cue that was anything but trauma informed, but it's because I had a layer of awareness and was really al allowing myself to reflect how I taught in a non judgmental way and then figure yes. out what to do. So the cue I was using, and I still hear this used by both Pilates instructors and yoga instructors, all teachers of movement, I would say is it was for footwork. And I try in a mat class to get that push and pull that people experience um, on the equipment. See if we can try to get that same activation, even if they've never experienced the equipment work. So my cue was, imagine somebody has hold of your feet and they're resisting you and they, and you're trying to pull your legs in. Okay. It worked beautifully to help people activate more. And I thought, dang it. What if that actually happened to someone that they had someone resisting them? And even if it's only 1% of the population, I was not willing to continue to use that cue and had to be resourceful, had to explore new opportunities for how to get that engagement. So you, so you're elected to just drop that cue outright to accommodate the one person that it might be mm -hmm. uncomfortable for. Yeah. And yeah. that's just, that's how uh, I work um, because it's not worth it. I want it to be inclusive. I don't want someone to be triggered, even though I know with anything, they have the possibility of that. Um, this is for me what it, what it means. And I, I teach on a spectrum, like you're, mm -hmm. it's not that you're either not trauma informed or you are, that there's this huge, huge spectrum of work. And so I turn to how a trauma informed approach has been incorporated into the yoga field it started yes. in a very clinical setting, counselor in the room, people pre-screened yoga teacher, right? And then uh, right. if someone was triggered, the counselor would deal with or work with the person who was triggered and continue to make sure that it's a positive relationship mm -hmm. uh, movement experience and 
their best practices kept changing. But what they realized, right, is like some people weren't coming in to a trauma-informed yoga class that was more clinical because they didn't want to. Um, and right. so the yoga community, not all yoga classes for sure. I've been to plenty of yoga classes where it's like, mm, no, no, <laughs> um, have embedded this into just their yoga studios because we know that people walk in with trauma. And another, like the final step I would say where I was like, yes, I need to do this, was reading um, The Body Keeps the Score in which he um, also worked with a lot of yoga instructors to create a trauma-informed yoga approach. And there was one passage in there that someone said that she felt like she really healed using the Pilates method because of the center and core activation. And it okay. goes back to like that sense of power and control with Pilates. I yes. also think, hey, I went to yoga right after I survived cancer and I didn't like it so much. I didn't go back for 10 years. It gives people another opportunity to explore movement in yes. a way that makes sense for them. And right. a lot of people are like, where's the trauma-informed Pilates? Where can I refer my clients to this? Yes. Um, and there's some people who haven't had really training in, in a trauma-informed approach, but embody that. And there's other people yeah. who know of a trauma-informed approach, understand trauma, but don't um, really incorporate that into their teaching. Like no action is taken. Yeah. Right. For those of you who are watching, um, like I know Lisa read yoga, for example, in the comment section, um, please share, do you have some sort, now that you've heard Beth talk about this, is there some kind of, trauma-informed approach that you've been using because a lot of times with these practices we are putting labels on things that we're already doing and then we're adding new layers and new ways of being intentional with it so i'm just out of curiosity if this is something that you're hearing or saying you're like yes i've been doing this for years and never knew that this was actually a thing um yes you bring happens, up such right? a good point because and that's something like it's in the very first module of my coursework that i highlight through this course, I want you to highlight and celebrate what you're doing that's already trauma informed. But yes. now you can be more intentional and maybe tap into that more. And then mm. opposite of that, you will look at those gaps, right? And yes. so when I turn to Facebook groups and a Pilates instructor, this was a two years ago, maybe a Pilates instructor says, oh my gosh, can you believe that people sit on the foot bar for legs and straps? That is so not, I don't know, forget the word that she used. And I thought, you know what? I did that. And people still do that. You yeah. know why? Is because it didn't bother me as a client to s have someone sit on the foot bar. It's what I saw when I was doing my student observation. It's what I did when I was doing my student teaching. No one ever thought to tell me of a different perspective. So I really try to approach it from a non-shaming and open way and share my personal examples along the way where I've course corrected because yeah. this is not about perfection. Um, and when we lead with shame, that's not going to move the conversation forward. It's going to close it down. And like guilt and just all these negative emotions start coming up. Absolutely. People can be mean, like straight up mean, <laughs> like, you know, um, so at least is saying like, yes, absolutely uh, built into my teaching. That's great. I mean, that's, I think that that's really the way to go and taking another level of, of intentionality would be to take a course like yours and to, you know, follow some of the work that you've been doing. Um, but like you said, people can be mean right? and, and leading with shame and leading with condemnation for approach or just to one up themselves, make themselves feel better. That's, that's, it's negative. It's toxic. It really is. And I, and I think it only goes back to, I was trained in California with Body Arts and Science International with Rail. Um, he was my teacher. Okay. I moved out to Colorado. And at the time, there were really no Body Arts and Science um, teachers. And so I wind up in this very classic Pilates studio. And our methods of teaching were much different. And yeah. it was challenging at first, you know? Mm -hmm. I, they did it the right way. I did it the wrong way. Um, I made a mistake one time about putting the equipment away. 
I left the studio putting the equipment away the way that I was trained, right? I had hundreds of hours in how to put away the equipment, but they did it a different way. And I forgot one day because it was like my second day working at the studio and I felt like crap, right? Um, Mm. And and all these like little, well, how do you teach footwork? That's not the right breathing. And all this stuff went on and on and on. And the more we worked together, we eventually came together it ended up being a really beautiful working relationship uh, for all the Pilates teachers where we learned from each other and yes. it helped our clients. What I also realized looking back at it now is that was our ego speaking and a little bit of defensiveness that there's only one way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realize now that I was the reacting and not responding because right before it was like the last day, Rail said, go learn other different approaches to teaching. You'll probably come back to this one though. Like he was encouraging us to learn and explore, but I don't think that that's encouraged all the time. I think more people are being inclusive. And I think Mm -hmm. like opening up real conversations to what is the difference between a more classic approach and contemporary and that this could actually help. What's the difference between, um, you know, Stott and Polestar. And the reason why this is important is because when I go into a yoga class, Vinyasa, Iyengar, Ashtanga, I know what I'm walking into, but we call Pilates, Pilates. And so when someone comes to me and they come to a classic studio and they're like, I've done Pilates for 10 years, whatever it may be. And then they start working on, they're like, oh, this reformer feels a lot different. Well, that's because it's like set up different than the balanced body typical reformer that that education piece for us as Mm -hmm. teachers and also just a little bit doesn't have to be like an academic coursework for Pilates students, I think can help empower them to make the right choice for them. And one last thing here, I do talk a lot, is when I was teaching an academic Pilates class. I listen a lot, class, so it's fine. <laughs> when I was teaching an academic Pilates class, um, I w- taught them like the Pilates principles. We moved with the Pilates principles. And then at the very end of the session, coursework, I would do, we're going to do a contemporary class. We're going to do a classic. We're going to do contemporary. We're going to do a classic. What do you like better? And I asked them, what do they like better? And it was just, it's from my viewpoint. So my viewpoint may be different than yours, but each student had a different perspective. Some like the classic more, some like the contemporary more. And it was really just put it out on the table, you explore. And then when you continue with your Pilates method, you may go to a teacher who you really enjoy and you may have a really negative experience. And I even said, because it's an academic class and once they're in it, they probably have to stay in it so that they don't like drop the class or get an app, right? You may not even like me, but I don't want you that to discourage you from continuing to explore with Pilates because there could be another teacher who you just totally vibe with and is going to be the right fit. Yes, absolutely. I would say the same thing in a different way. Where you were saying, you know, this is classical, this is contemporary, this is, you know, this is Rails way, this is this Pilates whatever's way. What are the differences? I would have said, what are the similarities? Mm. Where do they intersect? Mm -hmm. What are the things that are similar between? Okay, so we do this, then this, and then this is the order for this exercise. We both want our heels together, our toes apart with this one, but, you know, so where do they intersect? Where can we find the similarities in it? If there's one similarity, then it's okay, well, then now we can look at the differences. So it's almost coming at it from the, from the it's like cueing to the positive. You can cue mm-hmm. to the negative, you can cue to the positive. I think that there's a sense of looking at it from the perspective of where, do, where does the classical and the contemporary intersect? So if we're yes. calling this all Pilates, what are the similarities between these approaches? Okay, so now what is the point of emphasis in this one? And what is the point of emphasis in this one? Are we still trying to get back to this movement pattern? Are we still trying to get back to this breathing pattern? Are we still trying to get back to, and then from there, then we start to explore the differences. So I'm, you know, you, you could have been saying the same thing, but I, I hear it in a way that like, well, let's find and extract the similarities first mm-hmm. and then look at where the different points of emphasis are. Yeah, I I love that approach. Um, And I think that coming at it from that angle 
could really like ho help open the door for our deeper conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe, uh, thanks Takita. Um, I, and that could just come from as I layer in race right now, as a black man in Pilates, in the space, a non-dancer, whatever mm. binary differences you want to put on there. I have to, from my perspective, I'm trying to celebrate the similarities, whereas I've lived my life in a place where people try to highlight the differences. Mm. I'm just thinking of, of that. Yeah, and I think, and it goes back to, we all bring our own lived experience with us um, to a conversation, to a movement experience right and yeah. holding space for that sorry to use that word again <laughs> um, yeah. and being open to hearing and exploring that is so important right and so yeah. now what's beautiful for people listening to this live or i'm a leader and for myself like okay let's ponder that um because mm. i used to be and sometimes can still default to i know the answer right away and now it's like let, let me just let that integrate in a little bit more um, and see how that, how I shift along the path in the future. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, and even in these lives, I, I learned this early in the game, silence can be scary, right? <laughs> Especially on a Zoom call. And it's like, does anyone have any questions? Anybody, like you just, you try and fill that gap because it's so quiet, right? But I think that's the same in these conversations where, yeah, use that silence, processes. Does that, does that align with what I'm thinking? Are there similarities in that? Are there differences in it? I think that we need to be doing that. That's how we get better as teachers. Like we always have people in front of us and we're, we're all dedicated to this work and it starts with us doing that work from the inside out. It really does. Um, and I think I have over the years, since you bring up similarities, it was, again, back when I was teaching with the classic Pilates instructors, and we have, um, like, upstretch one, two, and three in the block system. Okay. And I was told I was teaching it wrong by teaching upstretch one. And then a few years later, like, oh, my gosh, look at this awesome archival work. That was a term that someone coined and what was it it was upstretch one why was it upstretch one it was a prep before someone is exposed to upstretch three the full upstretch right and so it was like mm. oh well maybe it's just broken down a little bit more um and so i think that that like once they realized that some of what they were trained in and what any of us are trained in our initial training is like the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> right? It, it is really a lifelong journey and being open to that. And any new training that we do, any new conversation that like really resonates with us and we take just a little piece with, that's like added to our resource, to our toolkit um, for future, for now and in the future growth, I would say as a mover, Absolutely. as a person and as a teacher. Yes. Absolutely. It's like driving and cars. Like I follow Lewis Hamilton and just because I have my driver's license and he has a driver's license doesn't mean that we are both the same level of driver. Right. There's a sense of, I got my Pilates instruction. I have my course. Um, I've done my certification. I'm now able to operate a vehicle, but that doesn't mean that I can enter an F1 race. I don't have that skill set yet. And we're always on this process of learning and honing our skills and getting better. But the fact that we did our certifications means that we're like legally able to operate the machine. That doesn't necessarily mean that we are the best operator in the world. We're on this journey still. We're still getting better every day. And that's the same for everyone who's taught us. So when you see that upstress one, two, and three, someone probably sat down and thought, this is the best way to get them to this place. And we took that as absolute concrete truth for everybody on the planet that teaches Pilates. That's not the case. Right? I think it's so, also not the case, like how, how each person is empowered to find their flow with 
as a mover of Pilates and as a teacher is so different. And I can say for years, I felt like a fake, like I didn't know Mm. it. Like I just kept taking these continuing education workshops. Like the more I learn about anatomy, the more that I learn about new exercises, the better I'll be as a teacher. And I just, something was always missing for me. And to be honest, the voices in the Pilates studio as a collective, and again, this was much a much different time. We didn't have social media. <laughs> um, I think yes. the iPhone like just came out, right? So we didn't have the connections that we do now. Like they were too loud for me to find my own authentic voice. And so that's one of the reasons why I left the Pilates studio to teach at a university setting. Um, And because I wanted to tap in more to my health education degree, wanted to bring Pilates to people who couldn't at the time access a Pilates studio in the hopes that if they have a positive movement experience that in the future, they'll attend a Pilates studio and feel more comfortable and confident to go in that space. But it wasn't Mm -hmm. until I had these other conversations that we weren't having in the Pilates world that we're starting to tap into more now that I really was like, oh, well, now I've stepped into since I've been exploring trauma-informed for over seven years, I would say now I've stepped into being my voice as an an authentic teacher. And I can say, this is my viewpoint and will work Mm -hmm. really well for others. And some of you will just take like one thing and then ditch the rest. And that's fine Mm -hmm. because we all have our own different path. And I think that's one aspect of social media that I appreciate because I try to focus in on the positive is that we can tap into how it best serves us so that we feel supported because before social media, right? If the studio you were in or the community you were in was not reflective of what you needed, it, it felt very isolating. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you there. <laughs> That's so true. Um, and we have, um, like you said, like we, we learn these things and we find our voice. And I, I, this beautiful way you said that, and that allows others to find their voice that empowers them to find and extract those truths for themselves and, and learn in a way that makes sense to them. So that's all really good stuff. That's um, yeah, no problem. I stopped going to the studio for those reasons as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you say are some of your takeaways? right now from this conversation and also at the same time your message for your people for lack of a better word some of the takeaways um not to be afraid to keep exploring with the method in a way that may seem non-traditional not classic contemporary but non-traditional in the way that we approach conventional Uh, At the end of the day, I'm trying to get out of saying using clients because I think that depersonalizes Mm -hmm. the people who come to us and say like, people come to us, right? And honoring their journey and ours at the same time. And so especially with the trauma-informed perspective, like sometimes I can tap into it and really like learn more. And other times that stepping away from it is best for that journey. And like, it just needs to process and integrate a little bit more uh, yes. being open to exploring conversations while staying true to yourself as well and know that right now like this is still a really weird time um yes, absolutely. and so a, a lot of people were referring to it as like a collective trauma and how we're all managing and coping as individuals and then family unit and Pilates community and studio is all very intertwined um, and muddy at the same time. So just Mm. honoring your path, what you need, doing what's best for you at this very moment, um, which that figuring that out, because I don't know, as a Pilates instructor, it's always like, no, do the exercise this way, right? We aren't tapped into here are your options. What what feels good to you? And people who work with me, it takes them a long time to unwind that. It's not only teaching Pilates. I would say we're taught that like growing up in grade school, like do it this way yes. and you get the A. But what's beautiful now with like math, for instance, I have kids who like do math, right? And they come home and there's like five different strategies for how to get to the answer. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish they would have had this when I was growing up, because I didn't get math, and my husband's like, 
oh my gosh, I just want the old way. And yeah. so there's so many options because what works well for one person is not going to work well for another. So yes. I think just tapping in as well to that connection piece. Um, connection. And for me, then when I, at the very beginning, you know, I said, well, my teaser isn't perfect. That's not what Pilates is about for, for me anymore. It's about how, when I step off the mat, when I step off the reformer and step into life, like, can I carry that positive energy with me? Does it feel uplifting? Sure, I make progress, right? Um, but it's about life, return to life. That's really what it's about. Yes, agreed. So good. Thank you so much for joining me today, Beth. That was, I, I love your passion for this. And I think you are doing amazing work with this, with this trauma informed approach. Can you put in the comment section or as, even when I put on the IG live, can you just write down like some of your links and stuff? I put it there as well, but um, I really feel like a lot of instructors out there can find life in what you're saying, what you're doing. Cause we mentioned it earlier, they may be doing it, but this makes it that much more intentional and it helps us to find those gaps in what we're doing and shows those opportunities to refine what we're doing to be able to better help our people. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you so much for having me on and being open to this conversation.